The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it, but keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, who when they hear all the statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I am setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read responsively Psalm 15. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth from their heart. They do not slander with the tongue. They do no evil to their friends. They do not discredit it upon a neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they honor those who fear the Lord. They have sworn upon their health and do not take back their word. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. The second reading comes from the first chapter of James. Every generous act of giving, with its perfect gift, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become kind, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious, and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. 
So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold the human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now, I love my dad. I, I really do. And I have a ton of respect for him as a man and as a father. And I don't know if I've told you this before, I probably have, but the, the man I call father, the guy who's come here and worshipped with us many times with my mom and my siblings, is not my biological father. My biological father was a man named Robert Fite, who unfortunately died of cancer when I was about a year old, and my brother was only a few days old. In fact, my little brother's baptism was at our father's funeral. How's that for the imagery of death and new life? So there was my mom, a widow in her early 30s with four children, including a toddler and a newborn. And along came Dave Dragsa. Now they had known each other since their high school years, but they reconnected. They fell in love and they married. And you know what? After they married, dad went through the process of legally adopting all four of us. There has not been a day, not once, has there been a time where he has treated us like anything other than his own children? Because we are. He's the only man I can ever remember calling dad, and he's always been there for me and my family. So that's why, that's why I love and respect this man, and he will always be my dad. But like any parents, he's got his quirks. Now, dad is the kind of person who likes things organized. He likes structure. Everything has a place where it's supposed to go. Things aren't supposed to be or look like they're a mess. When something's been used, it goes back in its proper place. Not somewhere else, not somewhere close, right in its place where it belongs. And in terms of parenting, I, I suppose you would call him more on the strict end of the spectrum. And of course, this sounds reasonable, right? For the most part, kids need rules and we need structure. Kids need expectations and they need to be held to them. Kids need to have boundaries and consequences for crossing those boundaries. But there are times when this can go maybe, maybe a little bit too far. So here's two examples from my, from my childhood. Shoes. My dad hates when shoes are tossed haphazardly onto the floor or just thrown into the closet. They should be neat. They should be lined up and in a row with the rest of the shoes in the closet. Well, one day, who knows why, my brother and I had left our shoes just sitting in the entryway, out of the closet. I'm sure we had just kicked them off our feet as we had come into the house for dinner, went to bed, just left them there. And even though we had already gone to bed, we weren't asleep, but we had gone to bed. He came to our room. He made us get back up. He made us march to the front door and pick up our shoes and put them where they belong. Number two, we had a computer. Now this was early on, I suppose, when computers uh, were around and we had a single desktop computer for the whole family. Now when I was in high school, I had a group of friends that would, that would come over, we'd get together and weekends we'd eat pizza, we'd watch terrible horror movies and we would play video games on our computers. So we'd set the computers up in the living room so that we could all sit around together and be watching these stupid movies uh, and playing games. Well, after we were done and in the morning, I would have to put the computer away, back on the desk in the basement and all plugged in, ready to go for mom and dad. And I can remember a time when I put the computer back 
And the cords, right, from the, from the PCU, from the monitor, from the keyboard, they all crossed each other around, because I, like, I just plugged them back in, put everything back together. And it looked like a mess. And I remember him coming to get me and taking me to the computer and having me unplug everything and run those cords so they weren't crossing and didn't look like a mess. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting stuff picked up and organized and put away neatly, put back how it was found. In fact, we might say that these are actually good and laudable things to teach young people. It teaches organization. It teaches responsibility. It builds a habit of keeping things clean and picked up. But here's the question, and the question our gospel text is struggling with. Can it go too far? At what point are we insisting on things being exactly where they are supposed to be and how they're supposed to be simply for its own sake? Churches, right, have lots of rules, written and unwritten, don't we? Who can go up to the altar? What things can go on the altar? What clothes or what cloths get used to cover the things on the altar? What banners we hang and when? What colors we use and what colors we wear and when we wear them? The order that things happen in worship. Who does the prayers? Who leads the meal? At what age do kids get Bibles or take communion or start confirmation? Who's expected to help out in the kitchen at funerals and potlucks? Who's expected to teach Sunday school? We could go on and on, right? And that's not a criticism. Most of these rules and these structures have good reasons behind them. There's a reason. There is a reason why we share the peace with one another before we come to the table for communion. And there's a reason we wait until kids are a certain age before we give them Bibles, have first communion, and start confirmation. There's meaning and purpose behind the colors and the banners and the look of the altar. If nothing else, and I think this is reason enough for these kinds of rules, it helps us to know what to expect every Sunday morning. Have you ever gone to a church service that was completely different? I remember going to a church service once where they had completely rearranged all the elements of the service into a different order. And you know what? I felt like I couldn't engage in worship. Now, maybe some of you would like that because it would keep you more engaged, more active in figuring out where we were. But for me, I felt like it was haphazard, like I could never connect with what was, with what was going on or I was flipping around. What page are we on or what book are we in? So worship seemed to be happening while I was shuffling around. But you know what else? I've been to a worship service entirely in a language that I did not know or understand. But the order, the rhythm, the pattern of worship was the same as what we do here almost every Sunday. And even though I could understand the language, I felt like I was engaged in that service because even if I didn't know the language, I knew what we were saying and I knew where we were in the flow. But like the rules and expectations of my dad, how they can seem a bit excessive, is there a point where the rules of the church begin to stifle our faith? That's what Jesus is dealing with in today's gospel lesson. The Pharisees and the scribes are the leaders of the temple and the leaders of the worship life of the people. It's their job to make sure things are done the way they're supposed to be done. To them, these things aren't trivial. To these Pharisees and scribes, these rules and boundaries and expectations are a part of how the people keep God's law. And that's no small thing right throughout the whole Old Testament. You hear the prophets preaching to the people, warning them that they've disobeyed God's law and that they'll be punished for that. In fact, the exile to Babylon, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem is all believed to have occurred because the people didn't obey God's law. So when the law and tradition say that there's a certain way you should wash and clean yourself and your food and your utensils before you eat, then that's what you do because it's been commanded by God. And these things matter so that we can keep God's law. They aren't just trying to give Jesus and his disciples a hard time. Of course, we know they are trying to give Jesus and his disciples a hard time. They're trying to discredit him. 
But they're also doing their part to try to ensure that God's law is kept. So here's the thing. Imagine for a moment that there is a core, a center, a nucleus to God's law that's imperative to keep. To violate that center, that core of God's law, means death and destruction for God's people. Now imagine it's your job to make sure that that core doesn't get violated. So you might be tempted to start expanding the rules to make sure we're all safe. So if, for example, if God's law said you had to wash before eating meat sacrificed to God, and you wanted to make sure the people never, ever violated that law, you might teach that whenever you eat anything, you need to ritually wash. Because if you ritually wash, before you eat anything, there's no chance you'll make the mistake of not washing before you eat meat sacrifice to God. Now think about doing that for all of God's laws, expanding them to ensure that the core, the center of God's law, definitely won't get violated if you keep all these other rules. That's what the religious leaders have done. They actually, there's a name for it. They call it building a fence around the Torah, building a fence around God's law. If you stay outside the fence, you can be sure, you can be certain you're not violating God's law. So when the scribes and the Pharisees see Jesus and his disciples eating without washing their hands, they aren't worried about proper hygiene. They're worried that Jesus and his disciples are showing disrespect for God's law. And that can't be tolerated. So maybe we can see a bit where they're coming from. We can begin to understand their concern. And if we're honest, we can probably see a bit of ourselves in them. The problem, as Jesus points out, is that in building this fence around the law and focusing so intently on the rules, they're missing God's grace. The whole point of God's law is to draw the people of God together in community. The law brings us closer to one another. It teaches us how to live in relationship to one another in the presence of God. The law is God's gift. Because through the law, you and I are able to come together on even ground, on an even playing field with one another. So that instead, the Pharisees have taken that law and they've turned it into a way to separate people, to divide them. If you don't do things the right way, if you don't follow the rules in exactly the way the right way, then you aren't following God correctly. And if I'm keeping the rules and keeping the traditions and am following God correctly, then I must be better than you. And anything bad that happens to us is your fault. So do you see? Do you see how a blind adherence to all these rules and traditions can separate us from each other rather than drawing us together as God intends? Jesus reorients our thinking. It's not these external acts that bring you closer to God. It's not the rules and traditions that make you a better person. It's not rules that make you holy or unholy. It's what's in your heart that matters. Jesus doesn't call us to follow the rules for their own sake. And Jesus, instead, Jesus calls us to turn ourselves and our lives towards one another. It's not washing your hands that makes you clean or unclean. It's how you relate to other people. It's how you treat other people. It's how you welcome and care for other people. These are the things that matter to Jesus. So Jesus isn't saying you shouldn't follow the law and you shouldn't wash your hands. You shouldn't ritually wash before you eat. And Jesus certainly isn't saying that we should just disregard God's law. Jesus is showing us that God's law rightfully orients us towards one another towards our neighbor and towards the stranger. That's the gift of the law and the grace of Jesus, relationship with God and with each other. When we let rules and traditions and cultural norms get in the way of those relationships, then we're not following Christ, we're following something else. Where we exclude others, where we are jealous of others, where we hold grudges against others, where we use stereotypes of other people based on any of the things that divide us, where we build walls and fences to keep others out and keep people who are different away from us. 
we're neglecting to follow Jesus because we're not oriented. Our hearts aren't oriented as Jesus calls them to be. It's why when in the second reading today, James can say, your anger does not produce God's righteousness. When we let things like anger or hate or greed or envy or spite fester in our hearts, all sorts of evil and brokenness come spilling out. And we might think we're justified. We might think that we're in the right and they're in the wrong. I mean, seriously, you know what makes me angry? People who continue to deny the best scientific evidence we have for how to manage a pandemic. When I see yet another story, just in the news this morning, of an anti-masking, anti-vaccine organizer who's led many to do the same, succumb to the death of COVID-19, makes me furious. And I, when I see school districts making masks optional, as if the option matters to a virus, it makes me angry. And when I hear of churches continuing to gather indoors and unmasked as we move into this fourth wave, one that has affected children more than any other wave so far, it makes me want to scream. But Jesus and James today both remind us that while that anger may feel justified, it doesn't produce righteousness. It doesn't produce holiness. It doesn't build up the body of Christ. In fact, it really only produces sin and brokenness, further dividing us. The remedy, both James and Jesus tell us this morning, is to recommit ourselves to following Jesus. And that always, always, leads us into deeper relationship with God and deeper relationship with one another. Jesus invites us to put aside all those things we let fester inside us and instead open our hearts up and see the image of God in each other, in all of God's people. Jesus invites us to experience the immeasurable love and grace and mercy of God in Jesus through each other. Jesus invites us into the work of tearing down the things we've built up to separate us from each other. Because Jesus teaches us that when we live in love and service to one another, that's when we see God among us. In the end, it's not so much about a set of rules, but about a journey. And a journey we take together, living outward from ourselves in relationship to one another. We follow Jesus on this journey, loving all of God's people exactly for who they are. And then in this, we begin to see the kingdom of God. Amen.